Um, I did not inquire, and I wanted to inquire whether of our presenters today anyone is on a particular time constraint and needs to go first. Okay, super. All right, then let's reorder <coughs> our agenda. And uh, we're now on Roman numeral two, Weaver's open meeting presentation, May 9th, 2012. And we'll jump down to point C, Canine Companions. Um, Commissioner Kamori, would you like to introduce our guest? I would be honored to. Judy Olson is one of the busiest women I know. Besides Canine Companions, which she's going to tell us all about here, she has to leave tonight because she's in Lions Club. She's also, I guess, as a children's advocate, is that, Judy? Or you just were a children's something with... Court-appointed special advocate. Okay, court-appointed court special advocate for children in the foster care program. She's also a, uh, I call her Judge Judy, for the city of Palmdale in code violations or something like that. Court of appeals court. Code violation appeals court, there you go. She's in Toastmasters, and she manages to work with this beautiful, beautiful animal, Brunhilde. So, Judy Olson, take it away. Good evening, and thank you for having me here. Canaan Companions for Independence is an organization homegrown in California, began in 1975, and is currently located at national headquarters in Santa Rosa. What this organization has done since that time is to provide service dogs for people with disabilities, whether it be physical, mental, or emotional, free of charge. What Canine Companions does <clears throat> is start from the birth of the dog. They do the, their own breeding program. They breed Labrador Retrievers and um, Golden Retrievers. And occasionally, they get a hybrid. They'll breed them together because they find they make the best service dogs. Now, when I talk about service dogs, <coughs> excuse me, the service dogs at CCI, and I'll say that instead of Canine Companions for Independence every time, service dogs <coughs> assist those people with disabilities that may need some help in order to live independently. They also raise and train hearing dogs, specifically for people with hearing impairments. They also raise skilled companion dogs. Now these are service dogs, but they work specifically with people with severe mental disabilities, cognitive disabilities, and they are specifically trained over and above your regular service dog. And the last one they have at the moment is a facility dog. Now this actually is a facility dog for a different program. We are with also, also with pet assisted therapy here in the valley. What a facility dog does, as she does, is visit nursing homes, hospitals, school classes, any organization that would benefit from a visit of a dog. And we recently started with Palmdale Regional just about right after they opened. And we're also with Hoffman Hospice. The dogs are owned and trained by their owner. And they become a team. There are 30 teams in the Valley that do the therapy work. One more initiative, though, that Canine Companions has developed since the <coughs> occurrence of the Iraq and Afghan wars is to have the Wounded Veterans Initiative. That is the one that is really getting pushed right now because it's been found out that over 40% of our military returning from those two battlefields have some degree of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And we've found out that a dog, as a companion to one of these people, is of a terrific benefit in getting them to re-enter society instead of being on that full alert concept that they were in the war, they get back to the United States, they can't function, but with a therapy dog by their side, they can. And the, just this year alone, CCI has placed 12 dogs with veterans, and the waiting list is very, very long. <laughs> Try not to snore. <laughs> CCI is a total nonprofit, 501c3. We exist only on donations. That goes from, and the the CCI maintains ownership of their dogs. So if you were to apply to get a service dog, let's say, from CCI, you would be invited, you would go through a massive interrogation and application process, first of all. Then you would be matched with a dog. If you're not personally amenable to the one they pick for you, they will keep trying until they get a perfect match, regardless of what category it is. At that point, you must report for two weeks of intensive training 
The dog has already been trained and knows 40 commands. Regardless of what category dog they are, 40 commands is your basic knowledge base. And then you are trained above that for your particular job and for the individual's needs. Every year you must return to headquarters with your dog for reevaluation and updating and make sure that you are doing what you were trained to do and that the dog is doing what they are trained to do. This continues the entire life of the dog as they are your partner. If you for some reason don't want the dog anymore or you might be deceased, the dog returns to CCI and is reassigned to another person. They are not given away, they are not sold. They maintain the dog themselves as a CCI. Our target population, as you may have ga gathered, is a disabled population. Now, it, as I said, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be emotional, but it is a disability that is somehow hindering their functioning in the, in the so-called normal world. The reason I'm here today, besides the fact that Vivian invited me, is I want to share some information with you, and I have packaged information for each of the commissioners and the chair to show you the length and breadth of the programs that are provided. What I would appreciate is if you could refer this program, the information about it, to any organization you know in the Valley or beyond. This particular program is, like many others, it's one of the best kept secrets around. And with all the veterans we have in this Valley, and many of them homeless or exhibiting signs of PTSD, this information should be sent out, or at least circulated. I do presentations on all the different types of dogs and the program in general. It can be from 20 minutes to an hour with a video and other media involved. And I'm willing to go anywhere I can to do this. So if you happen to be a member of Kiwanis or Rotary or a church group, a women's group, anything at all, uh, I left my name, CCI, and my cell phone on the front of this envelope. I am not in the book, anybody's phone book, because of my work with the uh, appeals court. <coughs> I don't want to be known. But Vivian can, get, can make sure that you get a hold of me. In here are pamphlets on each of the particular types of dogs, uh, a most recent publication of our newsletter, and anything else you might want to know, please give me a call. And if I possibly can get out and visit some of your organizations, I would appreciate it. And I think we might be able to spread the word and get more people involved. The dogs are trained. There may be a waiting time, depending on which dog you're looking for. But they are accessible, and they should be accessible. And they are free for the life of the dog. And your training is free. And your retraining every year is also free. Oh, thank you. Judy, be, before you step away, Judy, um, I want to check and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, Judy, you stated that there are 40 commands that are standard commands with all of the, all of the dogs. Yes. What are some of the basic commands um, that is across the board with, with the dogs? Well, basically, the, the sit, heel, stay, come quiet, down, you know, the normal things you might teach your own dog. How to turn off a light switch, how to pick up the telephone, how to open a door, sit in front of the door so the door doesn't close on you, and so other things that you normally wouldn't even think of having to do. But the dogs are well trained, you know, that for a house-based uh, setting, and they know all those. So when you go in to be trained, let's say I went in for a, th a dog, I would <coughs> have to know and learn all those 40 commands first and know how to give them to the dog, either by vocal or by hand signals. Wow. So you have to know that, you have to have that first, and then they specify the training for whatever your disability happens to be. Judy, if you wouldn't mind um, answering the questions into the mic, just so that it goes on the taping, that's fine. <coughs> uh, what I wanted to know was, um, do they vacuum and fold laundry? <laughs> <laughs> They do not vacuum, but they necessitate massive vacuuming, <laughs> and they, they don't fold laundry. They are basically your best friend. Wow. And what we found, with, especially with the wounded veterans, it's the social contact with the dog transfers to people. 
and is uh, one of the veterans that I have a video of. That says he walks. To, he's lost his leg in a when an IED exploded in front of him on duty in Afghanistan, and he was very self-conscious because he has the artificial leg. And he lives down south, and he's wearing shorts all the time, even to work. And he was very self-conscious of it. He didn't want to go out. But he says, when you have the dog with you, nobody sees you. They see the dog. Mm -hmm. And I know that myself. Uh, nobody cares who I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even bother wearing a name badge anymore, usually. Because when I go, for example, to Palmdale Regional Medical Center, we go once a week. And everybody's, oh, look at the dog, look at the dog. I'm just the other end of the leash. <laughs> That's it. So, uh, yeah, they, excuse me, get up, get up, get up. And the thing about, uh, now this particular thing, I just want to make one comment. She's a therapy dog. They do not have the same access that service dogs do under the Disabilities Act. So if anywhere I go with her, I have to ask. And when we go, for instance, Hoffman Hospice and Palmdale Regional had very, very detailed documents we had to provide, including her health records and everything, in order to be able to be in there, and they have to be maintained. Whereas a service dog has unlimited access. I have a question, yes. Uh, Judy, are you available on Mondays for this presentation? I'm on, depending on what time on Monday. Uh, the reason I asked the question, I'm a member of the uh, Lancaster Kiwanis, and we'd love to have you do a presentation. I can make time. <laughs> okay. We'll be in touch. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. You can sit down. Regarding home, homeless people, I see a lot of them with dogs, and now I wonder why they have them. So it's a therapy for them. How does this work with them? I can only tell you this. Um, let me give you a little story. There's a gentleman at the Pete Knight Veterans Home. Uh, we go there, too, once a month. And he surprised me because we always sit and talk to the people. They come out, and they, a lot of them, you know, under federal law right now, if one of those veterans had a dog that was a companion dog, like for PTSD or something, they are not allowed in the veterans homes. They have to leave them. And there's a law that they're trying to change now to make the dogs accessible into the veterans' homes. But anyhow, I was talking to him, and usually they talk about their wives or their children or whoever they left behind. He whips out a picture. It was his dog. So I see the, the homeless people with their dogs. Uh, it's the only companions they have, right? And you notice a lot of the dogs seem to be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm They're eating somehow, and uh, I was going to say, that brings up another question, though, that I, that I think we ought to look into, is homeless people with the dogs, are they allowed in shelters? That's a good I mean, question. Do you mean? Would the dog, I mean, if the man or per Just woman, a pet or a service pet allowed, dog? A pet, just a pet for a homeless person who is technically their service dog. Would they be allowed in the shelters? Or would the fact that he had a companion negate his being able to be in there? Judy, do you know if any of the people that you serve that have had companion dogs placed or therapy dogs are actually homeless people that live on the street? Or are these dogs just companions they've picked up? They're companions they picked up as far as I know. Or they were their pet before they became homeless. Hmm. Commissioner Mohammed, do you have any idea whether Lancaster Shelter accommodates pets? The last that I know, um, <coughs> a couple of years or so ago, they did not. But it has since then um, taken on a new ownership. So that would be something to be able to look into. Mm -hmm. do, you, <clears throat> do you have an opinion about the impact on the homeless community based on pet ownership? I've been done very little work with the homeless. I, before I moved out here three years ago, I worked, uh, was on the board of directors for the Salvation Army, and we did have a homeless shelter. And 
what we we did not allow the dogs in there was a, because Connecticut where I lived was very strict on health codes everywhere but what we would do is the people that had a cart or whatever they were living in or bringing for hauling their goods in we would find a place to park it right next to the shelter so that the the dogs were technically on the property they just weren't in the building um, but whereas for a homeless person that's their only contact that's the only person they can talk to it's their only emotional support it's too bad if they can't get into the shelter anyone else What's well that? thank you so much Judy Olson and canine Com companions and Brunhilde thank you would you like to stay the night <laughs> Vivian can drop her off later I'll, I'll drop her off on my way home <laughs> Thank you. She also is a mascot of the Palmdale Lions Club, and we have a meeting at 7, so I have to get her over there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Thank much you. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. Anyone else with a time constraint? Okay. Okay, and then we'll move on. Um, this is Asian American Heritage Month. We were given information about this by Supervisor Antonovich. Unfortunately, we weren't able to come up with a program presentation for that, but it also happens to be the month of Cinco de Mayo. And Arturo, could you introduce our guest from LULAC? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, today from uh, LULAC, we have uh, Jackie Contreras, who is uh, the uh, president of uh, the chapter here in uh, the Animal Valley, I believe Palmdale. <coughs> the Animal Valley, and she has been in numerous organizations and the Hispanic community is so proud to have her. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I almost didn't make it today, but here I am. Yay. Yay. I just want to do a little something about what LULAC is, very small part. Um, of our large part of organization that we are. We are 83 years in progress. Um, LULAC is the largest Latino civil rights and advocate, advocacy uh, group in the United States. We are 83 years old and are going strong. LULAC works to improve opportunities for Hispanic Americans from every region looking for freedom and honest way of life. Our priorities are civic participation, civil rights, economic empowerment, education, health, housing, immigration, public service, and technology. That's some of the things that we cover. Um, I was asked to talk about Cinco de Mayo because it's, it's uh, really big and celebrated over here in the United States. Um, and it's actually not real big for the Mexicans because it was a very small um, battle. Um, not a small battle, it was a small um, win for us because our real win was September 16th. Uh, and that's the right reason why Cinco de Mayo was just, was a small battle, but it was it was done greatly because there was so little um, fighters against the French. And uh, I'll read a little few pages. Hopefully, you'll have enough time. Okay, Cinco de Mayo is a, is a Mexican holiday which celebrates the victory over French forces on May fifth, eighteen sixty two, at the Battle of Puebla. It is often mistakenly thought of Mexico Independence Day, which is actually September sixteenth more of an emotional victory than a military one. To Mexicans, the Battle of Puebla represents Mexican resolve and bravery in the face of overwhelm overwhelming foe. The Battle of Puebla was not an isolated incident. There was a long, complicated history that led up to it. In 1957, the Reform War broke out in Mexico. It was a civil war, and it pitted liberals who believed in separation of church and state and freedom of religion. Against the, separate, uh, against the conservatives who favored a tight bond between Roman Catholic Church and Mexican, the Mexican state. This brutal, bloody war left the nation in shambles and bankrupt. When the war was over in 1961, the Mexican president, Benito Juarez, suspended all payment of foreign debt. Mexico simply did not have any money. This angered Great Britain, Spain, France. Countries were owed a great deal of money. The three nations agreed to work together to force Mexico to pay. The United States, which had considered Latin America as its backyard since the Marone Doctrine in 1823, was going through a civil war of its own and in no position to do anything about European, interve European intervention in Mexico. In December of 1861, armed forces of these three nations arrived off the coast of Veracruz and landed a month later in January 1862. This 
uh, desperate last minute diplomatic efforts by the Juarez administration persuaded Britain and Spain that the war would only further devastate the Mexican economy and was in no one's interest. The Spanish and the British forces left with the promise of future payment. France, however, was unconvinced and the French forces remained on, on Mexican soil. French forces captured the city of Campeche on February 27th and reinforcements from France arrived soon after. By early March, France, France's modern mili military machine had an efficient army in place, poised to capture Mexico City. Under the command of Count of Lorences, a veteran and a criminal war, criminal? Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> a French army set out for Mexico City. When they, when they reached Orizaba, they held up while, the, while as many of their troops had become ill. Meanwhile, an army of Mexican regulars under the command of 33-year-old Ignacio Zaragoza marched to meet him. The Mexican army was about 4,500 men strong. The French army, approximately 6,000. And they were much better armed and equipped than the Mexicans. The Mexicans occupied the city of Puebla and its two forts, Loreto and Guadalupe. The French attacked on, on the morning of May 5th. Lorenzo Lorences moved to attack. He believed that Puebla would fall easily. His incorrect information suggested that the gar garrison was much smaller than what, he, than what it really was, and the people of Puebla would surrender easily rather than risk the damage to their city. He decided to direct assault, ordering his men to concentrate on the strongest part of the defense, Guadalupe Fortress, which stood on the hill overlooking the city. He believed that once his men had taken the fort and had a cleared line to the city, the people of Puebla were dem demoralized and would surrender quickly. Attacking the forces directly would prove a major mistake. Lorences moved his, his artillery to into position and by noon had begun shelling Mexican defense positions. He ordered his infantry to attack three times. Each time they were repulsed by Mexicans. The Mexicans were almost overrun by these assaults, but bravely held their lines and defended their forts. By the third attack, the French artillery was running out of shells, and therefore their final assault was unsupported by artillery. The French retreated. After the third wave of the French um, infantry was forced to retreat, it had began to rain, and the foot troops were moving slowly. With no fear of the French artillery, Saragossa ordered his cavalry to attack the retreating French troops that had been ordered to retreat and become a route the Mexican regulars steamed out of the forts to pursue their foes. Lorences was forced to move the survivors to a distant position as Zaragoza called his men back to Puebla. At this point in the, in the battle, the young gener general named Porfirio Fili Fili Diaz made a name for himself, leading the cavalry attack the national arms have covered themselves in glory. It was a sound defeat for the French. Estimates place French casualties about 460 dead with almost that many wounded, while only 83 Mexicans were killed. Which is pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I thought. <laughs> Lorenz's quick retreat prevented the, the defeat um, from becoming a disaster, but still the battle became a huge moral morale build booster for the Mexicans. Saricosa sent a message to Mexico City, famously declaring las armas nacionales han cubierto de gloria, which is the national arms weapons, have covered themselves in glory. In Mexico City, President Juarez declared the 5th of May national holiday in the remembrance of that battle. So that was it. Thank you very much, Jackie. <clears throat> I appreciated very much the chance to meet with LULAC. And I was entertained to learn that so many Mexican Americans believe that Cinco de Mayo is actually the celebration of American distributors of beer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not. <laughs> Thanks so much. Did I understand correctly that um, the aggression by the European states was based in Mexico's inability to continue foreign repayment of loans? Yes, that's the reason why they actually were attacked, because they couldn't pay their money, and because they were attacking them, so how can they fight? So do you think that the United States could use that excuse and instead of the ones we use when we attack? I guess they don't, yeah. <laughs> Thank I you. I know, with only 83 miss, you know, that died, I think that would be right. proof that 
we don't sit down and not do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I understand we're expecting a celebration of the Americas. Yeah. In September. September. So uh -huh. we'll look forward to that. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Marshall, would you like to introduce your guests? Yes, I would probably like to do that. Very proud to do this this, after, this evening. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Gwen Cole and Linda Jones from the High Desert Alliance of Black School, of, um, Black School Educators. Uh, the club was one of the, well, the um, association. It was one of the first groups that I met when I moved to the Antelope Valley. And as far as it was just, they, even though there's a national affiliate, but this is the first time that, you know, working with the group, they really care about all students. And they're doing some work in my district, and I really want them to come and share because it impacts our community. So I'd like for them to come forward and speak to us, please. Good evening. Thank you for having us here, and I want to thank Commissioner Marshall for inviting us. Um, the National Alliance of uh, Black School Educators is a national nonprofit organization <clears throat> devoted to the academic success for our, our nation's children, particularly children of African descent. Um, it's in its 40th year. It has over uh, 20,000 educators, including teachers, administrators, superintendents, as well as corporations and institutional uh, institute uh, members. It was founded in 1970, and it's going very strong. We have an annual event, which will be held in Nashville, Tennessee, this November. Uh, so we're really looking forward to being down there with our group. Out of that, um, our subsidiary was birthed in 2007 by Miss Linda Jones, who um, wanted to bring the mission and the charge of our national organization here in the Antelope Valley. Uh, Miss Linda Jones, many of you know, is a Westside Union School Board member, and she's collaborated with all local educators, concerned community members, parents, teachers, and support staffs in the school. You hang around her long enough, she puts you to work. That's hmm. all I can hmm. say. I've had the pleasure of knowing Miss Linda Jones for over 15 years. I haven't stopped working since I met her. <laughs> um, currently, I am Gwen Cole, the president of High Desert Alliance of Black School Educators. So during the presentation, you'll hear me say High DAPSI. That's just our acronym because High Desert Alliance of Black School right. Educators is a long word. So um, forgive me for well, I wanted to make that clarity. Uh, the mission of HIDAPSI is to promote and facilitate the education of all students with a targeted focus on African American students in the Antelope Valley by establishing, we have established a coalition of educators, support staff, community members, and concerned parents to directly and indirectly get involved with the educational process. The brochure that you have in front of you uh, tell you our focus and some of our goals. There's a couple of things I want to uh, point out as far as our primary focus for this year, because we have a lot of them, but we had to hone down on a few. And that's professional development programs that strengthen skills of teachers, principals, specialists, superintendents, and school board members, information sharing on innovational instruction and learning strategies that have proven to successfully motivate African American students and increase academic success. We also um, have a policy advocacy to ensure high standards and quality in our public and private educational systems. And right now, what we have implemented in Eastside School District is our parent and student involvement, our advocacy to improve the communication between home and school, yes. which is not easy at all. <laughs> we are currently, we have a couple of highlights of what we do. Every year, we have a parent symposium. This uh, January 21st, we had a symposium with over 400 uh, students, parents, community people. I think all the superintendents, were, uh, most of them were present. We had board members. We had Norm Hinckley. We had a gamut of individuals and our special guest, Ms. Susan Taylor from the National Cares Mentoring Movement that understands the importance of being involved in student and their academic success. Um, 
We had, uh, we also have every year a business breakfast meeting, which is our one of our largest recruitment efforts to get businesses involved, to get community leaders involved, to get our teachers, our superintendents, our board members involved. So we will be extending our invitation to you all this year. Come check us out to see what we're about. We give our annual um, goals and our statements. We give our bylaws. We put everything so that you can understand who we are and what direction we're going. We have a couple of fun things we do as well. We have given out so far five scholarships to high school students um, over the years. And, and one, of the, our, one of our scholarships is the Joella Wilson Scholarship. Many of you may have known Miss Joella Wilson. She was a chartered member as well as a retired uh, teacher. And we felt it only befitting to name that scholarship in her name. And so we have, and we've been able to help many Many young people with some scholarship. Um, I love giving money. It's very fun. Haven't gotten all we wanted to give, but we've done a great job in the ones we have. We also have the Dr. William B. Shaw Award, and that um, award, Dr. Shaw was uh, the first African American superintendent at Keppel Union School District. Uh, and its focus is to uh, is because to a uh, school district that demonstrates success in closing the achievement gap between social economical students of color and white students. So again, focusing on how do we do and we uh, look at that information to close those gaps. We have also a new program that tomorrow, Linda and I will be busy tomorrow once again speaking with NASA. We have partnered with them on a STEM project because we want to bring a STEM project into High Dapsy to help our children understand um, how important it is and that they can just be involved in engineering, math. They can go in those areas. So we're excited about that, of being at the table with that and hopefully rolling that out. So stay tuned. Um, in front of you, you have a presentation, quickly. The project that we have um, is this presentation here, uh, the slides. It's our Parent University Leadership and Mentoring Institute. It's called Pull Me. And it is um, comprised of three personnel right now, myself, Linda Jones, and our Director of Parent Services, Ms. Pamela Stanley. Uh, under the No Child Left Behind Act, the school's responsible to build parent capacity involvement, also um, so parents can understand the state standards and uh, address issues related to parents' lack of education uh, that impact support of their child's academic needs, uh, and also to plan and implement these efforts through a meanif meaningful consultation. So these are some of the areas we are focused on. Uh, this, an effective program, there's three characteristics. One, you have to have a relationship. You have to understand the relationship that you're trying to build. Also, you have to have parent recognition. You got to give recognition and understand a family's needs and their cultural d diversities to also understand how to encourage them and to get them um, to get more involvement and understanding. And then finally, involvement. And that is bringing all the stakeholders to the table to discuss the issues and the needs of our parents. High Dapsy's Pull Me is designed in three-part modules. Um, and it's taught over a period of time that will support, empower, and motivate parents. And I'm only kind of laughing because by the time we worked all of the, um, the paperwork out, this project was designed to be over a 15-week project, but we we're currently doing it in about eight weeks. So it has really made us kind of step our game up a lot quicker than we had planned on, because it's a lot of touchy subjects that need time to really dig into, and we've not been able to. We kind of move in quite along, but having great success. After initial orientation of Pull Me, parents and parent mentors so we have two components. We have the parents that have been identified that need um, support, need um, encouragement, need some understanding and some additional training. And then we have parents that we identify that are successful already and their children are doing well in school. We partner those, partner those parents together so that they can mentor one another and we facilitate them through those so eventually they won't need us. Um, and they can continue maybe hopefully to bridge some relationships and also have who knows, lifelong relationships, I don't know, but it is our hope 
hope. And how do we do this um, in these three-part modules? The first module is um, learning their voice. We feel every parent needs to really, really understand how to learn their voice. And that's broken out in um, understanding their, their rights, understanding their child's rights, understanding school policies, best practices, and then also doing a pre-test or pre-survey so they un we understand what they're thinking, how's their skills, how do they see themselves on their parenting skills, their communication skills, how they talk to their children, how they talk to the teachers. And the second part, the second module is using their voice. Because we do know sometimes we don't use our voice properly and we don't get the result that we're seeking. And in using our voice is understanding leadership, all the definitions and types of parents, because we know there's many types of parents um, these days and the definition of that, and how to become an involved parent, how to also communicate with their teacher. We have a parent-teacher checklist that we give them a guideline of questions to ask when they go in the classroom so that they'll have some guideline of asking the, the correct questions so that they can get the information they need. We also have a, a discussion planner and it's a sheet of paper that they fill out before they sit down because sometimes when you're upset or it's something you need to resolve in conflict resolution, you need to know what you want to resolve or what is a good result resolve and then what direction you're going in that so how to use your voice and then the final is I have a voice which is the subtitle of our parent uh, university Institute and in I have a voice that is parent advocacy how to help other parents how to support other parents what is RTI looking at that process looking at the intervention in RTI also um, we have a circle of elders, which are retired educators who come and sit down and speak with the parents on some of the old school ways of how things were done, implementing some of those structures because that was good core foundation for, our, for some of us growing up. It was things that worked well try to re-implement those things. And then also for them to help guide and be there. If we can't be there and something comes up, they help and assist and go to the school to ensure that they're using their voice properly. Um, that's the uh, one of the parts. The other is our faith-based partnership. And in the faith-based partnership, we have parent centers in the churches where they can go and get help as well and talk to different leaders um, that is being trained under our program to understand the information and they can discuss it as well because sometimes when you're out of a certain environment you're a little bit more confident and, and can ask those questions those difficult questions we are also going to be developing our Department of Children and Family Service component which will help them understand those rules those regulations and how they work what they should do um, everybody walks away um, are scared of the word spanking your child but DCFS says there's a way you can spank your child and discipline your child see everybody's scared of that word I got spanked you guys for the record so but there's a way to discipline your child and we have regional administrators and social workers that is developing that component for us and will come in and train the parents on what is allow, allowed and what is not allowed and then finally at the end of all of this we identify some parent leaders ones that have stepped up and in you and they have a voice they will come to board meetings hopefully we can get some parents to come here after going through our university to present to you some of the things that they have learned they will we have our first test on monday they will be attending a board meeting crossing our fingers and these are some of our most boisterous parents that have learned that some of the ways they've handled things have not always yielded them the result that they were looking for so they are now demonstrating different ways of communicating and so they're going to demonstrate that on Monday if we don't show up at you know in front of you guys we know it didn't go well no I'm kidding we're very confident it's going to be great uh, because one of them is a really tough boisterous mom very boisterous, boisterous. So here's our here's our man. Want to politically correct, trying to tone it down. Here's our manual. Our manual um, 
and we've had to kind of cut this, you know, quite down for the nine-week session. So it is quite a bit of information that we disseminate to the parents. The biggest component of this ma manual is conflict resolution. We're learning in school that that is the biggest area of concern for both teachers and for parents. We have met with teachers. We meet with teachers. We go in the classroom. We make ourselves friendly. We let everyone know that we're here to bridge relationships, not to antagonize or to create a bigger problem. We have parents that are currently now going into the classroom and they're also, they didn't have student planners and Dr. Marshall was great about providing the student planner for all the parents and I have followed up with them and they're using them now. Thanks so much. that excuse the kids saying I don't have homework is not working anymore. So the kids don't like us much but the parents are loving us. Do you find? <laughs> yes, I'm a mentor. And then the um, the f one of the final pieces is this parent power. This is from the, uh, United, the U.S. Department of Education, and it talks about engagement in middle school and some of the things that you can do. Also, it has in high school as well. So although we're in the middle school, they'll have something to take with them to read over and kind of keep close to them as they go through, their ch children go through high school. So those are the pieces, and it comes in there. Parents are teachers wow. too their little kit here. So we have that. And I just, before I close, we have all types, and I loved your inspirational word because that is what we do with the parents when we're opening up on any workshop that we're sitting and talking with them. We want to impart something different, something new that maybe they haven't heard before and get their buy-in. So we talked about um, um, the... Uh, we, we talked about a couple of things, and I want to re quickly read you a story. Linda just gave me a note that says about the mentoring of the kids. We do have a component through Miss Susan Taylor where the parents who want their children mentored, which is not yet happening at Eastside, but it is happening for some of those parents in the community that we do mentor the children, so we match them. And that's a whole process for mentors to be matched with children. They have to have FBI background checks, all of those type right. of things. So they are getting matched and helping the kids. And we have parents who, um, I told them to call me anytime. They are really doing that anytime, Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, <laughs> they're calling me. But I'm, I'm more than happy to be there for them to help them because I would rather be a little inconvenienced to help them navigate through this process when they're emotional or upset. Um, this final word, I'd like to just read you this story that on our first orientation day, we I read to the parents, and it says, an anthropologist proposed a game to an African tribe of kids. He put a basket full of fruit near a tree and told them, whoever got there first won the sweet fruit. When he told them to run, they all took each other's hands and ran together, then sat together enjoying their treat. When he asked them why they had ran like that, one as one could have had all the fruit for himself, they said, Umbutu, how can one of us be happy if the other ones are sad? Hmm. Mbutu in the Zylos, African Zylos culture means, I am because we are. Thank you. Wait, wait, don't go. Yes, we have questions. <laughs> we have questions. <laughs> go ahead. My question is, um, this is really, first of all, this is absolutely beautiful Thank to you. be able to see something like that happening. I understand the communication that you're um, bridging between the parents and the um, students. How does that address the students who are parents, the teenagers? The teenage. We don't have any teenage um, parents currently in this project. The the school identifies the the parents that they want us to reach out to, and um, right now we don't have any teenage parents. However, I am the program coordinator for the Black Infant Health Program, and I've been sure. working with Black Infant Health for over seven years. I have experience, I have years of experience. I've been mentoring for 25 years. I really did not know there was a form, uh, formality to mentoring. I recently learned that about four years ago, but um, I know how to reach out to those um, those parents, uh, teenage parents, but we have not uh, created that component yet of this project. 
And this project was, um, I did not say this, but this project was a mimic from Dr. McKenna. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with Dr. McKenna, but he had huge success at Washington High School. Um, and Denzel Washington played his, um, right. his story, right. did his story. Uh, and Dr. McKenna is uh, a partner and a member with Hydapsy, also knows Linda, he taught Linda, and so he's taken us through a lot of training right. on how he, what he did in Washington High School. So we just, we, um, we customized it for the Antelope right. Valley through his direction. And he's allowed us to stay in the midst, and he want us to report to him on how we're doing wow. too, because he said his name is on this. So, <laughs> so. I want Didn't that answer your question. Thank you, it okay. did, and and I, and I knew you were familiar, so now I know from Black Infant Health. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I want to say publicly that it's one of the best decisions that I've made. I've made over the years. I've made lots of decisions, uh, some good, some bad, but this is one of the best decisions that I've made because. You can see it's been a short period of time, right? but you can see the difference. I was in Walmart yesterday uh, in, on, in Eastern Lancaster, and I'm walking through the, you know, just walking through the store, and some parents just come up to me uh, thanking me in terms of, thank you for bringing this program to our school district. Yeah. You know, it's just so, is it going to be, are you going to keep it next year? Yeah. Those are the questions that I'm already getting asked. As far as we were going to talk, I'll give you a sneak preview of a phone call tomorrow. Uh, there's been, you know, a lot of more parents want to be a part of it. Well, we have a cutoff right now because we have to keep doing what we have to do to accomplish because we have some but goals to accomplish. But thank you, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Marshall. It's awesome. It's an awesome program. Um, you can see the kids, the parents. I mean, it, it, we have so many resources in our community. I was going to uh, thank also in terms of uh, LULAC that we met. And uh, we had uh, Jackie. We met and we talked about some of the resources that your agency provided to us. You know, it talks about, look at the tapestry mission, what we, what we stand for. There's so much here in this community, and it's just a matter of just putting these resources in, and we're just very excited about that. Yeah. You know. And I do want to say to Commissioner Marshalls, um, of what you just said, many of the parents first came in with a, a very negative um, outlook on the school, on the teachers, the staff, um, just rather not they can get help. When we asked the question on the survey, do you feel welcome, most of them said that they did not feel welcome. However, after three weeks yep. of them understanding that they have a responsibility too, that it's not just the staff and you walk in the door and you expect everything. And one of the things as I told Miss Lucy, um, I told the parents that you go to one person in the school and they have to deal with hundreds of kids and parents and you're coming and you're upset, they are realizing that they have a responsibility. And so we have created a parent policy for Eastside and especially for the returning parents on how many times they'll visit the school, how many times they will reach out to the teachers, how will they continue to foster an open relationship with the teachers, and then also admitting what they have not done so well. And we've been able to get through that in three weeks. I really mm -hmm. thought it was going to take us longer, but we got through that in three weeks. So it's been um, quite an experience, and it's happened a whole lot quicker than I thought. They were waiting. They were wanting something. Yes. And um, the, staff huh? the staff has been Amazing. We've met with teachers. We presented to the teachers. We went to the union. We talked with them as well because it's a buy-in of all stakeholders for our kids. And we are seeing kids stop being tardy. They are getting in class. They're not having so many on-campus suspensions now of the parents that are involved in there because we are not just talk checking on them, but the mothers are calling us. The parents mm -hmm. are calling us as well. And we do have fathers at the table as well. Excellent. So. I had um, noted that you talked about the dispute resolution, the conflict resolution. Conflict resolution. I want to make sure that you know that if, God forbid, that you fail in your conflict resolution, we have a mediation program. We'd be happy to take your yes. referrals. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, does any of the programming that you've laid out have any specific way to address incidents of bullying? 
Uh, we do. We will be talking about bullying. I'm not sure how we, the way the program has been designed, that's Linda's specialty and what she will be doing. I'm not sure how much we can address the bullying part. Most of them, that question is on our survey, and they said their child has told them they've been bullied, and we know how big that issue is. And when you open up something and you have a, a, a workshop plan, that you want to, you have to get things accomplished because that is what we presented to the board. You tend to open up a huge can of worms. And so we're dealing with the top two issues that the parents and the teachers have identified as the need, and that's the open communication first. And then there is some issues of safety. So we're kind of incorporating that safety issue, I mean, the bullying issue into the safety, but not as much as we want to, to be very honest. And, by September, we should be able to have it completely a whole workshop like we plan it to be, as opposed to just about 45 minutes. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, uh, Gwen, yes. thank you so much. It, it occurred to me while I was listening to you that it is people like you that make these things happen. You can have a lot of good ideas, but unless there's someone driving them, they often fall by the wayside. So I, I personally appreciate your effort and the dynamism you bring to this process. It's an excellent program, but it needs a spirit and a motivator like you, and uh, I'm glad that you're involved in it. Thank you. Thank you. I have a sergeant, too. <laughs> I teased her. She let me tease her. But she has been my mentor. So when I talked to, I told the parents that, and I told them Linda was my mentor. I'm a parent. I was a single mom at 18, and I was told I would be nothing. I went on to school. I got a double degree. I did not have a lot of support. So when I came to this, and I married my lifelong soulmate 24 years ago, and the first day of this workshop was my 24th anniversary, too, by the way. <laughs> I, I told my husband, grab something. We'll do something later. I got to go to the workshop. But my point is um, my motivation and my passion comes from my life, where I came from, and what I have seen that you know God has blessed me with, and a mentor that stuck, be, stuck behind me through my good decisions and some of my bad ones. So um, that's where it all kind of stems from. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, thank you both. All right. Thank you. I, I just want to echo that as well, Gwen. You don't, you don't have to go back up there. But I just want to echo that, that thank you very much for that information. And anything that Linda Jones has founded and stood behind, it's, it's all good. I love Linda. She knows that. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, Brenda, I don't know if we keep track of this, but I just wanted to make sure, if necessary, that the record reflects that Commissioner um, Militello is with us, joined us at about 6.30. Yes. Thank you. And thanks for coming in, babe. <laughs> That's all right. Okay. Let's um, turn back to Commissioner Castagnon. You have another guest. Yes, Madam Chair. We have uh, with us uh, Rod Venegas. And uh, Rod Venegas has a long story here in the Anil Valley with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. I do appreciate his uh, making time for us today. He's uh, the vice president, right, of the Hispanic yes. Chamber of yes, Commerce? Yes, correct, yes. And uh, also he has a long, long time passion for education, but I'll let him talk about it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Arturo. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, this year actually is my 20th anniversary as a Hispanic community leader for this Antelo Valley. Cool. And um, so thank you. And uh, as far as uh, uh, being a vice president for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, I have been involved with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce since uh, uh, 2000. The chamber was uh, founded in 1997. And uh, the mission of the chamber is to empower and help small business owners to grow, to develop, and, and to be more successful. We serve as a vehicle to them to kind of break through the red tape with the uh, both cities, either Lancaster or Palmdale, whenever they need permits and they don't seem to understand the, uh, com compli the complications of it or how to resolve or fill out applications and so forth. So we kind of help them that way as well. Uh, through that, we also put together events uh, throughout the year. 
that makes us more involved with the community so that we give back to the community through the efforts of the in, in cooperation of the business the membership as well. Uh, throughout the year, we have at least uh, four events that we put together. One of them is uh, Dia de los Muertos. We also have Festival de las Americas. I know you guys were mentioning that before, but we do put that as well ourselves. Uh, we also have um, uh, Dancing with the Star. That's another fundraiser that we do. And <laughs> anybody that likes dancing, we are well known for putting pretty good uh, um, actually dancing events, per se. And also we have the, our yearly event, which is the installation where we install the new uh, officers, directors, uh, and president, and so forth. Each one of you commissioners have one of these uh, uh, yearly, uh, what we call the bridge, uh, which is a kind of a, a guide for the membership. And in there it gives you the, uh, who the president is, the executive, executive board, and the board of directors. It also gives you uh, the, uh, a list of all the members that I currently are uh, in good standing with the chamber. Right now we have at least 155 members. And so this may not reflect all of them because it, we continue having more and more uh, uh, members uh, coming aboard. So we do have that. You have this, uh, all of the members and everybody gets this when they do come to the uh, installation. But any new member that becomes a, a member for the Ch Hispanic Chamber does get one of these, uh, uh, which is a guide for the rest of all the other business owners that are members as well. And um, we also promote the community as a whole uh, throughout the different events that we participate. We have been involved with the Telemundo, uh, which part of that has to do with the educational committee that we do have. Uh, we do give scholarships. We, give, we, we have been given scholarships since 19, 2000, uh, actually since 2002, uh, we started giving scholarships to the different high schools. And so through all of that, we have been uh, not only giving back to the community, but we also do participate with other uh, organizations that are out of this valley that promotes, it helps us promote this valley as well. Uh, in 2010, the uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce was awarded the uh, Chamber of the Year, and that was for the Sunday region. And much of that recognition was also what helped us get recognition for the uh, Telemundo Group, which is the, one of the largest uh, Hispanic television uh, uh, program corporations. And they also gave us recognition for that as well. What we do here and what we try to do is not only promote the businesses uh, locally, but we try to also help them if they want to go outside of this valley to other corporations. Right now we have a program where we are putting together and we engage corporations with business owners. Uh, one of the uh, biggest corporations right now that we are dealing with is Walmart. So we're trying to get Walmart together and that's what we're gonna be doing. And many of the business owners that uh, could provide their services or goods to, the, to that Walmart corporation, uh, we're gonna be sitting down with the executive of the uh, Walmart on the Southern region to try to help the business owners here also get part of that uh, multi-million dollar corporation that they do business with. So we try to constantly find ways to promote not only the chamber, the community, but to help the business owners as well. And uh, we also get involved with Edwards Air Force. We uh, do attend their uh, yearly luncheons. Uh, we do get involved with uh, NASA here at uh, the uh, Plan 42 with the SOFIA program. So we are always trying to ex uh, not only just uh, help the business owners that are our membership, but also to let them know of what, is, what this uh, valley has that can benefit them as well. Uh, for example, uh, in one of our launches, we had uh, the uh, director for NASA, Mr. David McBride, and he spoke about all of the things that the NASA is doing, 
And some of the things that he also mentioned was the opportunity for people who are engineers. There's a lot of demand for engineers. Now, a lot of these business owners have children that are going to high school, to universities. So that, there, again, is that incentive of also through the uh, educational committee that we have to help these uh, owners and motivate them to motivate their kids so that they continue getting educated. And, and I take my hats off to these wonderful ladies here because you know, they, what they are doing is just, just wonderful. Uh, children is the future of this nation, and that is, has always been one of my really, really uh, uh, very, very, something that I really commit myself to and try to help our students, our youth. And uh, you know, personally, I used to give scholarships when I was doing quite well in my real estate businesses. I used to give uh, scholarships to the Pandel High School and so forth. And uh, so that is always a, th uh, a motivation that keeps me going. Find ways to get involved, have, find ways to give back to the community, and more importantly, find ways to help the, the youth, the students, mm -hmm. because through them, this nation will be better off uh, th than what it is right now. And so not only being part of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which does a lot of good for the community, for, for its membership as well, and we give back to the community, but also being involved with the uh, other organizations that have mentored uh, youth, that have mentored students so that they can empower themselves to become better citizens and uh, hopefully give back to the community if they stay within this community as well. So that is, uh, as a vice president for the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, that is, mm -hmm what the chamber does, and if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Well, I think that's extremely impressive, and this is extremely impressive, and this is a reflection of one year? No, actually, it is um, within one year, yes. It is uh, what happened within that year, all of the things that happened during that year. That's Every amazing. year, we impressive. put together a new magazine, and everything that we did within that year it goes into the into this uh, uh, well, that guide uh, for the expanded chambers. You know, so everything that happened during the year is put right here. So each and every year we have had one of these, and they all reflect different events that had happened, and different keynote speakers. As you can see, the uh, in our last installation, uh, Mike Antonovich was our keynote speaker. And in the past, we had had all their uh, very successful business owners as well. Because being a business organization, we try to bring people that are, have been very successful and, and to tell their story, how they became successful, what they did, what motivated them, what, what happened in their lives that motivated them, then drove them to reach such success. And so by doing that, it, it helps our business uh, membership as well. And one of the things that we're working on is also, we just got a grant from the, uh, uh, Wells Fargo, and we're going to utilize those funds to create uh, seminars where we can bring, again, different uh, successful individuals that can give their presentation to all the, the, the business owners or members that can participate uh, in those seminars. And all of these, uh, some of the seminars that we will be presenting will be free of charge. However, if we were to be serving lunch or something, then we would be charging just for the lunch fee. But uh, the, uh, the objective really is to bring people that can m motivate the business owners, our membership, uh, educate them, teach them, uh, show them how they can also uh, become successful as well. Very impressive. Questions? I have a question. Certainly. Uh, when do you meet? Um, in terms of, we have, uh, during the month, we have, um, a, on the first Tuesday of the month, okay. is the launch. And that's when we bring our keynote speakers for that month. And we send the emails to all of the membership. So that gives the opportunity to the members to uh, be at the launch and to do networking, to exchange a business card with each other. And you'll be surprised uh, that, uh, you know, if you participate long enough, eventually you will get businesses. It's just 
like prospecting gold, you know, like the all gold diggers. You know, they keep digging, digging, and eventually they found it. And that's what happens here in this business. Sometimes some people get discouraged because they become members and they think that becoming <coughs> by becoming members and go, going to hmm. one launch uh, meeting, they're gonna, you know, connect with all these people that's gonna give them businesses. And it doesn't work that way. It, you have to be there consistently. You have to persevere. So every Tuesday we do have the launch on that allows the, the business owners to participate there. And then we also have on the third Wednesday, we have a mixer that allows a member to open his doors or her, or her doors or their doors so that different business owners can come and see what their business is all about, what they offer, and uh, you know just kind of network again and exchange information. And so every board member, or rather every member of the chamber has the opportunity to do a mixer. And that is another way of uh, you know, exposing your business to the community as well. And so those are the times where you can be a part of that. However, if you wanted to give a presentation to the board uh, every second Tuesday, Wednesday, that's uh, when we have the board of directors meeting. And if you have uh, your business and you want to talk about your business, you want to give a presentation, of course, you put that on the agenda and, and you are given the opportunity to talk and see what you're all about. and. It also gives you the opportunity to see perhaps you want to become a member. And, and so there, there's uh, oh, ways that allows you not only to uh, see what the chamber can do for you, but also what you can do for the chamber. Thank you. By becoming a member and a, and a director if you. We are uh, all inclusive. So, you know, it, because we say Hispanic, it doesn't mean that it's just Hispanics. Correct. You can be black, you can be Anglo Hazon, you know. We have all kinds of members and directors as well. So if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, uh, we are members of the uh, of your your chamber of commerce. My uh, no, our former superintendent had a year membership with with the organization. Well, even the Palmdale School District is a member. Yes. Of, of the organization and so correct. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, what is it? Galisi. Superintendent Gisele. You see, like however you pronounce that last right. name. Hmm. But uh, <clears throat> but yeah, and, and they do attend our launches. Okay. So they are there and. And so forth. Right. So, thank you. Other questions? Mr. Venegas, thank you very much for coming in. When you were asked to come see us, did you have anything in mind that you wished that we could partner with the chamber? You know, it's uh, we have done a lot of things uh, uh, in Palmdale. We really haven't had the opportunity to really do much in the city of Lancaster. And I don't know whether there is that lack of communication or interest from the Lancaster city to get involved with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce with us. Uh, but now that you mentioned that, I think that there is an opportunity uh, with the, uh, more so I believe would be with the uh, uh, educational committee. I think that what is happening here in the, in the Lancaster as well as the Pandel area and, and us having an educational committee, I think that we can uh, somehow get involved with you guys or you guys can get involved so that we can uh, be more proactive and somehow uh, probably create some kind of a program where we can uh, help the parents or help the students. I think that there's an opportunity for that. Uh, in the past, I know that uh, Kathy Contreras, Jackie Contreras, she was also very involved in my committee at that time. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do for the Lancaster City. I think that it's just a matter of opening the doors, communicating, and, you know, see what we can do. Well, the city has limited resources, but we seem to have um, quite a number of interested people who'd like to make change. So if you come up with an idea, please consider the door open. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. And on behalf of the Hispanic Chambers, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. It's that. our pleasure. Yes.